Hi hey everybody, Keith Tanner here from Fly Miata, and today we're going to talk about alignment. Um, it's something that everybody has, something that most people understand. Hopefully we can bring a little more understanding. It's something that not everyone does understand. So it's important to how your car works. And so today we're going to talk about the theory behind alignment, sort of what are all the different aspects of alignment, um, of wheel alignment, front and rear. Not so much here's how they get the fastest lap time around Button Willow CC13 or CW13 or whatever. This is more along the lines of what is camber, what does it do, what does caster do, why do I want it, why do I not want it, what's the difference between an NA and an ND in that regard, etc. Um, as always, if you have questions, please put them in the comments. Last week we had a lot of questions. It was actually a lot more fun to do because I felt there was actually somebody on the other side of the camera besides Travis. And, uh, and it, it usually takes the discussion into interesting directions. So please, if you do have questions, throw them in the comments. We will do our best to answer them. So, alignment. It's an important part of, uh, of your car's handling. You know, basically your, your wheels are what determine where your car goes, and if your wheels are all pointing in different directions, obviously it's going to have a hard time deciding where to go. Now, one thing to know, if you do have an ND or a brand new NC or brand new NA, these cars are not really aligned at the factory. Uh, you can tell from looking at new cars right off, the, uh, right off the truck, all the alignment cams, all the adjustments are just set to the middle. They're ish. And the factory alignment specs are also set with a fairly big level of acceptable. They're basically mostly, I have not hit a tree recently, and so therefore my wheels are pretty good. That's factory alignment specs. Um, those of us who are interested in performance usually want something a little more precise, a little more towards one edge of the tolerance spectrum or another. So I would strongly recommend if you do get an ND, a brand new ND, the first thing you should do is take it down to the alignment shop. And you'll be surprised. The steering will be better, the handling will be better, the grip will be better. Your wheel, um, or your, your tire durability will probably improve. Uh, our first ND, when we took delivery of it at Fly Miata, we, uh, I think it came into the shop on Wednesday. We had it on the track on Thursday, and on Friday I was in the pits at the track screwing with the alignment settings. That's how long the factory alignment lasted on that car. So, today we are going to be using my little friend here as a, uh, as a visual aid, and I'm going to concentrate mostly on the front. The reason for that is because the front has a couple of aspects of alignment that the rear doesn't really, but everything that's present in the rear is present in the front. So I'll mention what is applicable and what isn't. Now the first thing we're going to talk about is toe, because toe is fairly easy to understand. It's actually pretty easy, especially in the, in the front, to adjust at home, and it's easy to play with. So I do always, as always, strongly recommend if you really want to know the effects of some of these things, just screw with it, try it, but take notes so you can go back to unscrewing it if you need to. So, toe. What is toe? Toe is basically the alignment of your wheels relative to your center line. It's if the car is pigeon-toed, if it's got its wheels pointed in, or whether its wheels are pointed out. This car, actually, if you look at it from above, Travis, you will see it has a huge amount of toe in in the back. Positive toe, as it's usually called. Um, but this is for stability on this thing, because obviously the driver is a long way away from this car and it's very high performance, so the wheels are, are uh, aimed inwards to give you more stability in the straight line. At the expense of, as you can see, tire wear. Um, nothing wears tires faster than an incorrect toe setting. So just if you do find that you're getting very, very rapid tire wear, um, toe is usually the problem. Um, so you have toe on the front and the back, and it has a big effect on the car's stability and a big effect on the car's cornering behavior as well. Um, you can probably imagine that having the wheels towed out is going to make the car more interested in turning. It's, it's going to make it want to change directions more because it's going to, you know, as you, if your wheels are pointed like this, as you turn this way, this one starts going straight and this one says, I'm leaving over here, so he wins. Uh, or she, uh, we won't assume. Um, if they're pointed inwards, you're going to find that this wheel will be fighting the one that's trying to turn in one direction. So having toe in or positive toe is generally more stable. Having toe out is generally less stable or more responsive. But if you go too far, you start getting weird behaviors. Um, you start getting steering that feels like it's got a dead spot in it. Um, you start getting very darty feeling, which is, you know, autocrossers are looking for darty because that means excellent turn in. But there's been a number of times when I've been chasing odd steering feel and it's come down to toe settings. Um, front wheel drive cars, rear wheel drive cars. It's a very easy thing to check. You can actually check it yourself with a couple of tape measures and a couple of boards. I didn't think to grab my toe plates inside this pile of stuff here. Um, but all you really need to do is you put a couple of plates over the end of the wheels and measure the distance in the front, measure the distance in the back, and the dis difference is your toe. So they're very easy to check at home. 
very easy to change at home because all you need to do, and Travis, you want to come in here. Actually, we'll show, we'll look in the real car. We'll look over in the real car. Um, this is the tie rod. This is what attaches the steering upright to the steering arm on the upright. And I'll look at that in a moment. But basically, if you adjust the length of this, that will tow your car in and out. You make it longer, the, the wheels go tow out. You make it shorter, the wheels go tow in. Um, that's how it works on a Miata because we're a Miata shop. Um, if you have a rear steer car with a steering rack behind, that will be different. That will be the opposite. But we're going to focus all of this alignment information is going to be biased towards Miatas because that's what we do. So um, this is kind of get ahead of myself. This is what a spindle looks like. This is this is off an NA or an NB. I'm not sure which, uh, but it's very similar to what's hiding behind that brake rotor in there. It's got two pivots. The ball joints go through right here. Uh, and then it's got a steering arm, which is the thing that the, the rack moves, and that gives you your steering. Fairly straightforward. Um, we just had this because it's kind of a handy thing to have around. But Do we have any questions so far, Travis? Anything about tow? We have one, but it's about camber. Camber? Well, we're going to get to camber. <laughs> is it a, Well, shoot it. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll see if I get there. Um, question is, how does camber curve front and rear impact wheel alignment strategies and thus, how suspension springs, roll bars, and coilovers impact your alignment? Oh, wow. Going right to the big question. The question is, how does camber gain, basically the change in camber with roll or suspension movement, equate to chosen alignment strategies? How does that interact with sway bars and springs and basically everything? Uh, the question was, what is everything? And it, it, I'm going to try to work through that piece by piece. <laughs> I mean, hopefully it's what you'll come away with when we're done. Uh, so let's talk about camber, because camber is the one that we we often play with the most and so do you feel the most. In this car you can see camber is the amount of lean on the tire if you will. If you look at it straight from the front, um, tires that are leaning in at the front have negative camber, tires that are leaning out of the front if they're Miatas they're broken uh, but that also means that it's positive camber. Um, pretty unlikely on a Miata but yeah it's, it's a factory car at full droop can get there. Um, so that is that is what camber is, how much, they're, how much your tires are leaned in and as suspensions move through their travel, they, they change camber. And how much they change depends on the design choices of the suspension. Um, this is an off-road sort of car with lots and lots of suspension travel. So it's designed to have relatively small amounts of camber change because it's expected to be moving all over the place. Um, Miatas tend to have a lot of camber change because that tends to give you more cornering grip. I'm extremely oversimplifying here. But, uh, but yeah, on a Miata you would find if you did the same, the same movement, I should have brought a different remote control car for this, you would see the wheels really tucking at the top. You see lots and lots of negative camber. And the amount of that camber change with suspension travel is called camber gain usually. Um, suspensions like the Miata's multi-link or, uh, or double wishbone suspension, you have a lot more control as a suspension designer over how much camber gain you get. Um, cars that run struts, generally have a lot more, a lot fewer options because of the packaging requirements of a strut. So strut-based suspension, such as that mini hiding back there, um, tends to have a lot less camber gain uh, than a purpose-built platform like the Miata, which that's one of the reasons why the Miata grips as well as it does, why it handles as well as it does, because it has the luxury of, of good control of camber gain. And there certainly are examples of cars that work with struts. The Porsche 911 is a great example of engineering over fundamental design, but uh, generally speaking, we're out of shop, we're going to talk about these. So, what's the point of camber? Well, one thing about camber is it develops a little bit of a thrust. If, you're, if you've got a tire that's leaned in like this, it's going to be sort of pushing in this direction, which is great. If you're in the middle of a corner, go around the corner please, thank you. If you're in the middle of a corner and you're leaned over and you've got that, that wheel really cambered in, it's going to be pushing inboard on the, on the corner. It's also going to be trying to smear itself across the pavement. So having some camber in there will help get the load a little more evenly distributed across the tire. It'll help force the car around the corner, basically in cornering camber good, fundamentally. And we'll often use camber to adjust the amount of cornering grip that you have. Um, you know, if you, if you see an alignment that has more camber up front than the rear, then it's probably going to generate a little more grip up front, all else being equal. If you take a car that hasn't been, you know, you don't change anything else and you add a bunch of camber in the rear, you're going to find that your front grip will go up, your rear won't, the car will start to oversteer it a little bit more, um, and vice versa, et cetera, et cetera. So we can use it as a tuning tool. And those of you who pay attention to Miata 
alignment settings, and there are some people who pay a lot of attention to me at alignment settings, know that there's almost two different schools of thoughts for setting up the NA and the NB in terms of camber front to rear. Um, there's the old classic one, which has about a half degree more camber in the rear than in the front. Uh, that is based off Miata, Mazda's own original design specs. Um, it's basically just taken a little further than usual. So that's effectively how Mazda set up the chassis from the factory. And then there's a, a more race bias setup that has grown up out of well, spec Miata racing and the super Miata racing and a lot of very dedicated Miata race cars that run a lot more front negative camber and less rear, but they also adjust the spring rates. They adjust the, um, the sway bar settings. You know, the, the rest of the suspension is also set up to suit. So if you do choose an alignment, if you are looking for an alignment for your car, make sure you understand the rest of the expectations. Um, you know, if the car is going to have a high rear spring rate, if it's going to have a bigger rear bar, um, you know, aero load, that sort of thing comes into it as well. But it is, uh, you are going to see both of those. So you tend to associate camber with performance. You know, you see a performance car, it's got its wheels tucked in like that. A lot of people think that it wears tires quickly on the street. And over the course of tens of thousands of miles, um, it does. It does. You will see that the tire will wear at an angle across the tread surface. I do not have a nice illustration here, but you'll see characteristic camber wear is basically tapered all the way across. If you see sharp wear right at the inside edge, that's a toe problem, and that's far more likely to happen. Um, most people misdiagnose toe problems as camber problems when they're just looking at tire wear, but I digress to some extent. Do we have any questions, Travis? I'm sure I have. If I had my MG in here, I could show you exactly what bad toe looks like because I had a toe problem in that car, and uh, the front tires are just totally trashed from the toe problem. So that is camber. Um, it's a number. It's a little harder to adjust at home because it generally interacts with some of the other settings on the car. Uh, unless you have, say, our adjustable rear control arms, um, that gives you the ability to adjust camber without changing anything else. Um, but generally speaking, the more camber, the better for cornering ability. And that's why you tend to see it. It's visible on Miatas. It's visible on all Miatas. You'll see the camber on the thing. Now, caster. This is an interesting one. Caster comes from, and you can't really see it. You can see it really well in this car. Let me put it on this thing. Boy, how convenient that I happen to have the right tool to do this right here. This car has a lot of caster. There we go. Now you see the angle that this is the angle between the upper and lower. We'll pretend these are ball joints. They're not really ball joints in this thing, but sort of. Um, the angle right here, that is your caster angle. Um, you'll probably see it best if you look straight on. This, is, this one's got a lot of caster. It's really leaned back. And what that does is caster, it, uh, one of the things it does, a lot of it is straight line stability. Um, you know, the, the imaginary point, if you draw a line between these two where it hits the ground, which I believe is often called the Dave point, thanks to Dave Coleman writing in uh, Sport Compact Car Magazine so many years ago, um, that is the, the theoretical line where this meets. And then the, the sort of the, the point where the wheel meet is further back. And that means that your drag is behind the pivot point, so it has a tendency to pull the wheel straight. And if you look at a shopping cart caster, you'll see that exact thing going on. So this has a lot to do with stability. The, the greater that distance between the Dave point, thank you, Dave, and the, uh, and the center of the wheel, um, sort of the more straight line stability you have, the more the car will want to pull itself straight um, as you're going down the road. So that's, that's good. Um, you like that. A lot of caster tends to make the steering a little heavier, too, because you're pulling for harder to get it off center. Um, it can cause problems with tram lining where the car is trying to go downhill. If you're, if you're driving along, say, through the Eisenhower Tunnel and the... Uh, in the passes in Colorado, there's big grooves in there from the trucks going through. And if you're driving a Miata, it's always trying to climb its way out of the grooves and the things are all over the place. But there's something else caster does, and that is it adds camber. Now, it's hard to see on this thing. This thing has a lot of caster, but if you see, this has got, you know, so much camber right now. And then when I turn the wheel, it picks up a lot of camber in this direction. So it actually helps with your cornering, especially at higher, higher wheel angles. So that's why you'll, you'll see caster in there. And you'll often see in alignments that people will try to run as much caster as they can. Um, because on a performance car, you're usually willing to put up with a little more weight to the steering, a little more effort against it, um, to get that straight line stability, to get that cornering grip from, uh, from having that extra camber gain when you turn in. Uh, on the ND in particular, because it's got that electric power steering rack with a great big enormous motor on it, it runs an extreme amount of caster. Um, the specifications are for something like 11 degrees, I think. 
and the uh, and the factory NAs and MBs are more like four and a half or something like that. Uh, and the reason for that is because it can use the big motor to overcome that extra that extra load basically of, of the self centering. Um, and that is something I would strongly recommend again with the ND. The first time you get it, it's not going to have enough caster from the factory, even though it was aligned at the factory. You're going to want to throw all that caster in there, and your steering, you will thank me for that. Especially if you have one of the first two years of the rag top with the, uh, with the first rack. A lot of people don't know the rack changed. Um, it didn't have great on center feel. It is much improved by adding a whole bunch of whole whack of caster um, to that thing. Again, that's the rag tops, 2016, 2017. The 18's got the new rack. All the RFs have the new rack. So there you go. Let's get back together again. Actually, there is something else. There's something else called scrub radius. And this isn't, this is almost a little bit of a theoretical thing. But if you take your day point, if you take your, you take your angle coming down here and you take where it, where it uh, meets the ground, and then you take the center line of the wheel, if that is... If the center line of the wheel lines up with that point, you have zero scrub radius. And what that means basically is that the wheel is pivoting right around the center of the wheel. Um, if you have a positive scrub radius, it means that the wheel is further outboard. If you have a negative scrub radius, it means it's inboard, which I can't pull off here. Um, but that, effect, that is affected by the offset of your wheel. And as Miata people, we have a tendency to put on much lower offset wheels. Um, sometimes because it's the only way we can fit on monster tires. You know, if you, an NA came from the factory with plus 45, 45 millimeter offsets, if you want to run a set of 15 by 10s on that poor little thing, you need to run a 25 millimeter offset. You need to move it outboard by 20 millimeters. Um, and we are willing to accept the results of that, of that scrub radius. There is a, always a purest train of thought that thinks that you need to keep the scrub radius as close to zero as possible. And what scrub radius does is it basically puts some leverage on that wheel. Um, if you're hitting bumps, this looks like I have a terrible wheel bearing because it's not actually seated yet. But um, When you hit a bump with a lot of scrub radius, it, it's a lot of leverage for the bump to sort of move your steering for you instead of you moving your steering. So that's where you get a lot of steering kickback going over bumps, going over curbs. Um, if you have a lot of offset going on, um, your stability on, on, you know, basically on rough roads, basically what happens. At, or you can look at a steering feel where every little piece of bump going on there gets a lot of feedback in the steering wheel. This feedback and kickback, they feel a lot alike. It's just a matter of, you know, potatoes and potatoes. Um, so wheel offset is an important part of, it is a factor in that. And if you're using wheel spacers as well, um, that has the same effect as changing offset. If you want to know what your offset is with, say, a three millimeter spacer, just add three millimeters to, or take your three millimeters away from your offset number. Um, if you're a, if, if you are enthused about wheels that have a lot of poke, if you're running zero offset 15 of eights, you probably already know about the whole kickback problem. Um, but you know, those are the extreme cases when you're running enormous amounts of, uh, of offset. You've got a lot of scrub radius. It's, not, it's usually a factor that we ignore because of the other benefits that we get out of doing whatever it is we're doing, running the offsets we are, running the wheel widths we are, the tire widths. So we usually just kind of ignore scrub radius, but that's what it is. Do we have any questions, Travis, as I monologue about scrub radius? We have one. What is our question, Travis? Um, what do we recommend for a stock 1999 NB for autocross, if it matters, he's got Coney Yellows, and <laughs> one of Apes, Braybar, and RE71Rs? Okay, so another question. I'm surprised we haven't had more of these. What is the perfect alignment for me? What am I doing? Um, autocrosser with an NB with Coney's, and what were the springs again? Um, he didn't mention springs, but uh, one, and a one and an eighth inch slate bar and RE71Rs. Big front bar, big front bar, RE71Rs, and mystery springs. Um, <laughs> without knowing the spring rates, it's hard to say for sure. Again, that comes back to those two different sort of styles of alignment you get on the NA and the NB, where the uh, one, one design has a lot of front camber, um, usually a big front bar. That tends to be used a lot in autocross. Um, autocrossers, because of their lower speed ranges and because they've effectively got the higher, you know, they're in lower gears, so they have more ability to rotate with the back end, they tend to run a setup that is more biased towards understeer than, say, a track driver will, who wants something that's a little more balanced front to rear so he can balance it right on the knife edge and a long sweeper. Um, autocrossers are more interested in getting the car to turn in, making sure the back is planted coming out of the corner, and they can always just huck it into the corner to get it to turn. So, generally speaking, Generally, extreme rough, uh, extreme 
generalization, you will set a car up a little more towards understeer for, for autocross, which usually will mean more front camber, less rear bar, um, you know, a little more front spring, big front bar. Uh, in the case of our, of our, uh, our commenter with the unknown spring rates, just commented he's got stock sport package springs. Stock sport package springs. Okay, so that's a that's a package other than his giant front bar was originally designed to use that setup with a little bit more rear camber. Um, that's I'm not an autocross expert myself. I've dabbled in it. I did my first autocross back in 1993, uh, but I've never been hardcore serious about it. Um, I don't know if I'd go to a full like Super Miata style, lots and lots of front camber setup on that with those stock springs. Um, Honestly, it, you'd, you'd have to ask the autocross community for specific examples on that one. Um, I'm going to go to some of the questions I had in here. Uh, do alignments for track vary from alignments for autocross, specifically camber? And that is exactly, yes, it does. Um, although usually I think it's done with a rear sway bar. But, uh, but yes, you, will, you may find that uh, autocrossers may run a little more front camber than rear because, uh, because of that, uh, that need for being able to put the power down out of the corners. They also tend to run less toe or you know, um, toe out, basically, to try to get that instant response. The sort of thing might make a car a little twitchy at 120 miles an hour, but at 55 feels fantastic because you can nail around that, that uh, cone. So they tend to be a little towed out um, for maximum response, and they tend to be set up a little bit looser in the front end or a little tighter, I guess, if you want to use that, that terminology. Um, a little more biased towards understeer because they can rotate the car either by pitching it in or by using the fact that they're in second gear as opposed to being in fourth. Um, there's one very good question here. Actually, let's go to this one. Bump steer. There's a question here about bump steer. Now, what bump steer is, is the change in toe with suspension travel. Um, you know, people think of as, well, if I hit a bump with one wheel, is the car going to go in one direction? Well, that's sort of what's going on. And I think we can illustrate with this. This car actually has surprisingly little bump steer because it's set up for long travel. But I'm going to try to set this up so that it's set for basically zero toe on this nice line here. And then as I move to the travel, oh, look at that. See, it went toe out. Here we go. It's got zero toe, a little bit towed in. And as I go to full compression, it goes towed out which is a good idea in this car because, one, the driver's not inside it to feel what's going on. As it, as it uh, you know, he turns into a corner, it leans, it'll actually sort of understeer a little bit um, for you. So you tend to get big swings in tow at the extremes of suspension travel. And there's a lot of guys, uh, a lot of companies spending money to move your racks up and down. It's a geometry question, bump steer. Um, in order to get the perfect bump steer, you can never get rid of it completely. What you can do is make sure it's in, a, it's in a good range in the suspension travel you're expecting to use. This thing's expecting to use a lot of suspension travel, so the designers paid a fair bit of attention to its bump steer. Something like a Miata, especially an autocross one that's only using a little bit, you know, it's probably got a fairly low static ride height, it's only got a little bit of actual suspension travel. You'll probably want to optimize the bump steer in that range even if it means screwing it up at the other end of the range because you're never there. Travis is laughing at something. He's got some sort of question going on. Would you like some questions? Um, yeah, I think I've covered bump steer. So bump steer, I'm just going to finish up on this. It's a geometry thing. There is no single adjustment for a bump steer. It's got to do with the relative change in length of your, uh, of your tie rod. As the suspension moves, you know, the relative position of these pivot points to these pivot points as the suspension moves. So the only way to adjust it is to move the steering arm up and down or to move the rack up and down. So it, and, and really with, um, really only with trial and error. It's a really fun thing to play with. You can, uh, you can test bump steer with a couple of dial gauges. Uh, maybe I'll do one of those. If there's a lot of interest, a lot of questions about this, I'm, I may show how to measure bump steer um, at some point in the future. But it's one of those things that's not an easy thing to adjust, but there are lots of people who are willing to sell you parts to do it. Don't just bolt them on there. If you really want to do it right, you've got to measure. So, Travis, let's go to those questions. We have four questions. Four questions. First one. What do we recommend for an NC 2009 PRHT 25-49-17 RE71 Stage 2 FM suspension for autocross, very small tracks with the fender rolls, flat in the back, not pulled? Okay, so that was a very, very, very specific what should my alignment be question. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to try to answer everybody's, I apologize, I did ask for questions. Um, I'm not really looking for, you know, what is my perfect alignment. Uh, 
today. If you are doing autocross, I would recommend you talk to autocross experts on that one. Guys who are running at that front end of the nationals, they'll often share their information. Um, and they're going to be a better source than I will. I'm trying to give you an idea of what the various things are and what they do. Then this is the right setup for this one particular use. I apologize. Travis. Wheel spacers, question mark? Wheel spacers, question mark. These are wheel spacers. Um, yeah, so wheel spacers do not have any effect on your alignment. Um, your offset has no effect on your alignment. All of these, all these alignment numbers I'm looking at, you can extend the wheel out indefinitely and they will end up the same. The one thing that changes with, with wheel offset and wheel spacers, which are the same thing, um, is that scrub radius I mentioned earlier. So that's a question we get a lot, is can I get it aligned on such and such a tires and then put on my good wheels? Do I have to change my alignment when I'm running these wheels? And the, the answer is the actual alignment settings will not change with your different wheel tire setups because the alignment is all measured basically at the hub, at the face of the wheel. So hopefully that answers that question. Travis. You'll like this one. How to measure and change the Ackerman angle and what numbers or behavior is ideal? Ackerman. Okay. Now we're getting into the real hardcore stuff. This is where you get, welders are involved. Ackerman is, you can't see it. This one doesn't have a whole lot of Ackerman. It's the difference. It's basically the change in tow with steering angle. Um, because your, your outside and your inside wheels are actually going on different arcs at a, uh, at a hard corner. Um, this one, like I said, this, one, this has almost no Ackerman, no visible Ackerman at all, but that's what it is. Um, you will find that some cars will turn the inside wheel more than the outside wheel because that inside wheel is on a smaller radius. Um, and it's another geometry question. It's got to do with where the steering rack sits front to back relative to the, uh, to the uprights. That's not something you're adjusting without a welder. Ackerman is what it is, and it's honestly, it's one of those things if you read the, if you read the literature there's all sorts of counterexamples as to cars that shouldn't really work, but they still do despite having Ackerman that should be completely wrong. So it's one of those things that you can't really adjust it, and it doesn't seem to be as important as a lot of other aspects, so don't worry about it, basically. If you're building a low cost from scratch, if you're welding up your own, uh, your own chassis, that's the sort of thing you can obsess over for months, and that's why you never finish your low cost. Um, sometimes it's better just to stick it on there and see what happens, but on a Miata, you're not going to adjust it. And where a Miata shops, that's what we're talking about. I will say that when we were doing the V8 conversion, doing the, the subframe work on the ND, where we had to move the rack, we had to change the rack to a two completely different style, we spent a lot of time playing with bump steer, playing with Ackerman, making sure that we were able to keep the Miata's handling characteristics by keeping those in the same range, despite the fact that we've moved the racks. So yes, if you're doing that, if you're welding a completely different steering rack onto a completely different car, because you've ripped out 150 horsepower and you've installed 450, then yes, at that point you start paying a little more attention to it. But most of the time, not an issue. Travis. Two part question. Um, this person says, I believe you have a live axle on your MG. How do you tune the rear suspension on it, being that there is no alignment adjustment, and how do you like the feel of the live axle? Okay. The, the comment is, you have a live axle in your MG. This is true. Um, and how do you deal with alignment on that? And uh, yeah, live axles are a different case. They don't have camber gain. They're always square to the road, basically. You know, the car leans, that wheel is going to stay straight up and down no matter what. Um, there are some... You know, you can get away with a little bit of, you bend the actual axle and get a little bit of camber out of it. Um, think of what that does to your wheel bearings. Uh, so there are ways, you know, guys who have been racing vintage Camaros, for example, they know all about that stuff. Toe is the same sort of thing. It's always straight forward, straight up and down. Great for drag racing, by the way. That's a nice, you know, your wheel is straight up and down, straight up and straight down the road. That is going to be your maximum traction for drag racing. But our slightly more dynamic uh, independent rear suspensions with their camber gain and their toe change under under compression and stuff like that um, can be a little you know they're a little more interesting in that regard. There are some things you can change in the alignment on a uh, on a live axle car, but since there are a very very small number of live axle Miatas, I'm not going to get into it too deep. I personally don't like it a whole lot. It's a lot of mass. Uh, the unsprung weight on that car is very high because the uh, relatively speaking because it's a 23 2400 pound car and it's got this massive rear live axle bouncing around. It's actually been proven to be more difficult to set up and to get working to my satisfaction than a Miata of the same power and weight and everything because of that big honking chunk of steel flopping around in the back. So there you go, live axles. Part two? We have many questions rolling in. Excellent, many questions. I like many okay, questions. Okay, so 
Uh, the alignment is here to enhance the use of the tire and tweaks behavior. How lower grip surfaces impact your alignment can thus change the between directional and asymmetrical tires. There's a, there's a few things to unpack in that one. Uh, the question is fundamentally, the, the first question, the first part of the question is how does grip level affect your alignment? And to this one, I'm going to go back to my friend Richard Decker, who's hopefully, oh, hi Richard, if you're watching. Um, Richard watches afterwards and watch live, but he does. Uh, he used to ice race, and I know that he used to align his Miata every year when fall came, so he, it would have different alignment for the ice racing, and I believe they run less camber. Uh, on the ice racing. They're probably not getting the same thrust. They're probably trying to mis maximize the sheer amount of rubber on the road or studs. I don't know if you ran in the studded glasses. Um, so it does make sense that in an extreme low grip situation, you may want different, uh, different alignment. Also, because you're not going to be rolling as much either. So you're not going to have as much camber gain from the roll. Um, and there are some tires that respond better to a lot of camber than others. Uh, so it's not so much a matter of grip level, it's just that's what this tire likes. You know, certain Hoosiers, for example, people know that those things want all the camber in the world, whereas you may overheat the inside edge on certain other, you know, say a 200 treadwear tire, they may not like it as much. And that comes down to individual tires, the guys who obsess over what is the right tire for the autocross nationals this year. They're the sort of guys who can tell you if this tire likes a lot of camber or doesn't like a lot of camber. Generally speaking, on a street-driven Miata, you can't get in the point where there's too much camber. Uh, it's pretty hard to. Um, but... But yeah, you, you get to the point where you're tuning for the tires. And most of that comes down to the camber as well. It's, the camber is the biggest, the one you see the biggest variation in. It's the one people play with the most. You run as much caster as you can. You run toe in a very small range. And then you just screw around with the, the camber all over the place. I will take a drink while you come up with the next question, Travis. We have two very specific questions. The first one, while you're drinking, what are your thoughts on the R package tie rod ends? Thoughts on the what are my thoughts on the R package tie rod ends? Now, see the R package tie rod ends are a tie rod end that Mazda added to the NA Miatas back in the 1990s. They first showed up in 1993, so this is what 27 years ago. And what they were was effectively they were a spacer. I think they're shorter. Um, yeah, I think they're slightly shorter than the factory tie rod or factory ball joints that go on here. They effectively um, raise the steering arm is a, more or less what they did. Um, and the, the idea to do that was to move the, the bump steer happy range closer to the ride height of the very slightly lower um, R package cars. R package cars didn't sit super low. They were about 13 inches front and rear. Um, you know, the Fly Miata Springs run a little bit lower than that. But because of that, it's become a, a common upgrade, especially on NAs that have been lowered a little bit to bring the bump steer into range. If you're going to be changing out the tie rods the tie rod ends anyway, it's a good way to go. Uh, now the NBs, and I haven't done any bump steer testing on this, the NBs, when Mazda redesigned the car and the suspension, I went through this a little while ago, they raised, I think they raised this, they, they moved the steering arm up. And because of that, you know, the position of the rack, the position, the ideal tie rod end is not necessarily going to be the same because it's moved the bump steer around. And I think that's why they did it was for, was for bump steer. So it could be that you don't need the R package tie rod ends with the NB uprights. And that's something I haven't done any experimentation with. I think I probably should. I think I need to do some actual bump steer testing. And we'll, we'll share the results on that and play around a little bit. Because it's something I played with. Boy, it's been over a decade since I was last playing a bump steer. And I came up with the numbers I needed to then. And I haven't touched it since. <laughs> so such is the nature of trying to learn everything. Uh, do we have more questions there, Travis? We've got a couple. This All is right. another really specific one. Um, will NC front camber wear tire a lot within negative 1 to negative 1.5 for road use? Okay. Uh, the question is, will an NC specifically see a lot of camber wear on a tire with 1 to 1.5 degrees on regular road use? And the answer is no. That's not enough. You know, if you, if you get right down to the wear bars, you're going to start to be able to see that, yes, maybe the inside edge wore slightly. But effectively what that means is over the entire surface of the tire, there's going to be about a one degree, and that's assuming you spend all your time on interstates and don't go around corners, be about a one degree taper on that, which is not really very much. You know, you do the trigonometry and you realize how much one degree is across a 185 or a 205 or a 245 tire. It's not really that much extra wear. So camber does not really lend itself to a lot of, tri a lot of tire wear on street use. If you are rampaging around the canyons, and you're spending all of your time at maximum G and you're, you're basically your commute to work is an autocross 
at that point, you're going to start seeing a lot of extra wear on the outside edge of the tires because they're sort of rolling over in the corners. You need more camber to protect from that. Um, so you've got to go to a lot, a lot of camber in order to start seeing excessive tire wear. And like I said, it's almost always toe that does it. It really is toe that, uh, that kills tires much more than camber. Alignment shops may tell you different, but that's not really how it works. They just you know, they think, well, the tire's on an angle. Of course it's going to wear more. Uh, not really, because cars don't always go straight. Wheels are always moving up and down, and it's not that much of a difference. Travis. Does wheel stretch affect alignment? Does wheel stretch affect alignment? I'm assuming that means tire stretch, and that, I assume that means that you're running some super skinny. Yeah, a, a, a wider than recommended wheel. And, and most of the racers uh, stretch as well. The answer is no. Um, it doesn't affect your alignment in terms of what actually gets measured. You know, if you, the numbers are going to be the exact same. Whether you should run a different alignment because you're stretched. If you're doing a performance, you need to run the, the, uh, the alignment numbers that get you the most performance. If you're doing it because it looks cool, make sure your, your uh, toe is in good position so you don't wear out your inside edge of the tires. Um, I've seen a bunch of the, I've seen a number of sort of stance-oriented cars with a lot, a lot of camber and very difficult to see under the car because of it. Um, wear out the inside edge of the tire because of toe problem. They usually blame it on camber, um, but it's usually because of toe problem and the fact that they just can't see what's going on. Now, we did have a question earlier about bushings and what that means. Um, the bushings are really important for your alignment because if your bushings are loose, then that means your control arms are moving around. I don't have a car here with bad bushings, and luckily, um, but you can, in extreme cases, you can move the wheel around and it's. It, it, there's no point in how good your alignment is because the wheel is going to go somewhere else anyway. It means a lot of noise in your suspension. It sounds terrible, but it also means that your wheels are going to be pointing in effectively random directions. And you can also get weird tire wear that you don't expect. You can say toe wear, for example, um, if you have bad tie rod ends. Um, because what will happen is the car is going down the road, the slop and tie rod ends will allow the tires to toe out. You'll start ripping up the insides of the tires, but when you put it on the rack, they're nice and straight up and down because you don't have that dynamic load forcing them apart. Um, I've seen the same thing on one of my BMWs, actually. I had the same thing happen. It, was, it had some bad bushings in the back, um, and when the car was going down the road, it was basically dragging its wheels, and it was wore out the inside edge of the tires because of that dynamic toe. It aligned just fine otherwise. Um, so bushings are very important. Uh, I would recommend, if you're running an NA or an MB, you know, the newest MB is 15 years old by this point. They're made of rubber bushings. Putting in a good set of new bushings is not a terrible idea. We've talked about different types of bushings in the past on this channel. Um, if you're driving aggressively, uh, then you may want, to, uh, may want to consider making sure you have fresh bushings or stiffer than stock bushings. Um, but the bushings are very important because those are the pivot points that your suspension moves on. If they're allowed to move around, if they're allowed to send you sort of slop, then all the precision that you're trying to put in with your alignment is lost. So, Travis, I think we had another question. You were making little finger noises mm -hmm. over there. And this goes back to last week's video. Should you corner weight first and then set your alignment? That is actually a good question. Uh, the question is, and this goes back to last week's video, should you corner weight first and then align, or should you align first and then corner weight? And if you follow my recommended procedure for alignment that I went through last week, which is adjusting all four corners at the same time to make sure that your levels stay, the, your ride height stay the same, your, your rake stays the same, then it really doesn't matter. Um, the, uh, the alignment will not be affected by the lack of change in ride height. Uh, the corner weighting will not be significantly affected by the alignment either. Um, I would probably, given the choice, I would actually probably align first and then corner weight just in case significant changes in alignment change the angle, the spring slightly. It's unlikely to make much of a difference. It's unlikely to make a noticeable difference, but if you have to do one before the other, I'd probably do alignment before corner weighting. Also because having a bad alignment, you know, if you've just changed all your control arms, all your bushings, will tear up your tires, whereas a bad corner weight will not. <laughs> so it's not critical if your car is in the ballpark to start off with. Um, if the car is way out, do the alignment first because it'll save your tires. It'll save you gross changes in the, um, in the, uh, in the position of where the springs sit. But do make sure you set your ride heights first. That's important. Get your ride heights first, and then you can, no matter which one you're doing first, get your ride heights, get your, your uh, rake, set that first, and then you can go on with the rest of the setup. Hopefully that, uh, that answered the question we were looking for there. Uh, doo -doo -doo. I added plus 2.3% toe in my NC track car. My lap times went up 15%. How and why? I don't know which end was added there. Um, 
a percentage toe. That's an, a, not a usual way of it's probably degrees, two degree, two or three degrees of toe on an NC track car. Uh, that's uh, not enough information to be able to say on that one, I'm afraid. Yeah, I probably shouldn't bother with that one. How well does pulling the control arms or putting load on a corner to max camber for autocross? That one, I unfortunately, if you were the one who asked that question, if you could, if you could give us a little more information on that, um, one of the ways, how well does pulling the control arms? One of the ways that Spec Miata racers will accidentally get a little more camber before the extended lower ball joints became available was to bend the front upper control arms. Um, you know, you you take this and you accidentally have a small accident, uh, a very well controlled accident, and you effectively shorten this arm. Um, that will give you more camber, and I know that. I have maybe seen that done in the pits at a Spec Miata race or a Spec Miata racer. When we, I was on the Mazda team when we raced the first MX-5 Cup prototypes uh, in 2006 at Thunderhill, and we had a very well respected and well well known uh, Spec Miata setup guy with us, and we we're having trouble with not enough camber, and so he disappeared with our upper control arms and came back later after some noise, and we had camber. So yeah, that is that is potentially what's asking. If you want to try to get more camber, you can. Bend the arms. It's not the best choice. Extended lower ball joints, better choice. Um, partly because you end up with clearance problems on the inside edge there, and also bending a suspension component. It's only going to keep bending. Anyway, more questions, Travis. If you have stiff bushings like PU, do you have to align it with a little less toe because it's less wiggle um, compared to normal bushings? Okay, the question is if you have stiff bushings such as polyurethane, do you have to line it with less toe? Um, I can see where that's coming from. If you think there's enough flex in the factory bushings that the toe is changing dynamically, uh, it shouldn't really. Um, you know, the, the things that determine toe are not moving that much. Uh, most of the toe, most of the deflection that's taking place from having toe is at the tire surface, uh, at, the, at the, the tread surface. So that's what's going to actually take up the, the toe difference. Um, it would be an interesting experiment to play, though, wouldn't it? It is to, uh, is to play with try to find out what the ideal toe setting is and good luck trying to define how you exactly determine that um, with rubber bushings and then install polyurethanes and try it again. Um, yeah, I can see maybe a little bit, but not enormously so. That's, that's getting into some pretty fine tuning stuff in there. Travis. When you're clearancing for wheel travel, are you checking full travel at full lock? Well, that was a completely unrelated question. When you are clearancing for wheel travel, are you checking for full travel at full lock? Yes. Yeah. Um, if a wheel can get into a certain place, it will get into that place at some point. So when we are, this car has been clearanced for 245s, um, when, and we are determining that, one of the things that we'll do, and there's pictures of, of us doing this, especially to Indy in the build diary, is we'll put on the tire we're planning on using, we'll take off the springs so we can get full, full movement, and we will put a jack under here and jack this thing up all the way into the wheel well and then rotate it side to side to make sure that we're clear everywhere. So you definitely want to, when you are clearancing for a big tire, um, make sure that at the alignment setting you're going to use uh, that you have all the clearance you're going to need because you will rub. At some point, there's always a bump big enough. There's always a car movement weird enough that the, car, the wheel will end up in that position. Uh, and that's one of the first things we do when we're designing a suspension for a new chassis. And we'll sometimes go back and check it as we'll go and determine our absolute maximum travel numbers uh, at the time, where the limits are, whether it's the tire hitting something, whether it's the control arms hitting something. You develop a real appreciation for what factory engineers have done to get maximum travel out of these suspensions. You, just, you discover there's little divots, little clearances, little kinks in, in various arms that at full compression all of a sudden give you just that little bit of extra clearance that you need. Remember the back of the ND in particular, I think there's a couple that are like that. Travis. Last question, very off topic. Are C5 Corvettes just big Miatas? Are C5 Corvettes just big Miatas? And I'm going to say no because they have a transverse leaf spring in the rear, which is weird. Um, honestly, I don't have any speed time in a C5 Corvette, so I don't know. I have a lot of respect for their performance. Uh, they are considerably bigger. Um, they come with LS engines pre-installed, which saves a lot of work for those who want an LS engine. Uh, but are they big Miatas? Maybe, some ways. They have more fiberglass in them. Let's go back here and have a look at what the rear suspension on the ND Miata looks like. This is interesting. If, you have, if you're used to NAs and NBs with their very classic double wishbone suspension, this thing's got a multi-link back here, which um, the NC has something very similar. And this allows Mazda to design in all sorts of interesting kinematics. And one thing that's interesting about these is the NC was designed to go 
slightly toe out on, uh, on turn in, on wheel compression. I don't know if it was done with bushings or done with, with suspension geometry, I forget. But they had very, very good turn in because of that. They would dive into the corner because the moment this rear wheel sort of loaded up, it would point outwards and sort of drive the outside of the wheel to the outside of the corner. That's where rear toe comes in. I didn't really get to that. I plan to. Um, rear toe will determine how stable your car is in a corner. If, you, if you've got toe out in the back, it's going to rotate, shall we say, very enthusiastically. Um, the ND is designed to toe in slightly um, under that sort of load. And the NAs and NBs, they had some toe characteristics with bushing change as well. I think they towed in under load. I think that's one of the reasons why these feel more like an NA or an NB than the NC did, is because of that reverse toe behavior under load. But, uh, but yeah, there's five links in here. There's all sorts of interesting things going on so that the wheel, when it moves through its travel, when it's moving up and down, forward and back, that it, um, and they do move forward and back, uh, that it, it does exactly what the engineers wanted to do in the design work. This is something I think Maz or, um, Mercedes is one of the first to do this, but with the rise in computer aided design, they're able to come up with some really interesting kinematics back here. But it doesn't really change how you align it. Um, you know, it's still aligned back here for camber and toe, camber and toe are interchangeable. They're not interchangeable, they're, they're very heavily related in, um, in rear suspensions because changing one usually changes the other, so you got a lot of back and forth on that. And if you wanted to change camber only, you'd probably put an adjustable length in there, although that would also attract your toe because of this thing, all sorts of interesting stuff. So if, you haven't, if you're used to just NAs and NBs with their very, very classic wishbone on the top, wishbone on the bottom, um, the NCs and NDs have a lot of really interesting stuff going on back here. We're talking about wheel clearance. This is one of the things you need to do if you want to clear big wheels on an ND. And we have instructions for this on our brake lines, um, is this thing. This is where the, uh, the brake line usually is anchored. Uh, it's usually anchored right here. It will actually interfere with a big tire and actually even stock tires under really, really hard use. And this is actually recommended for the Global Cup cars um, that you basically delete this mounting point and we add a new mounting point right here to, to hold it in place. You'll see instructions for that on, on our brake lines. But that's what you need for maximum wheel clearance on one of these. Any more questions, Travis? One is a little off topic. How much prep goes into each live video? <laughs> How much prep goes into each live video? If you only knew, it's mostly Keith trying to, we decide usually Monday or so what we're going to do. Um, we make sure that we have the visual aids we're going to have for that week, whether it's you know me grabbing my remote control car out of the back of the garage or, or Travis bringing a, uh, you know, running up to the shop and, and grabbing a, a spindle or me digging around and the stuff that's in the back for some random yada part I have on the shelf. Um, but very much of this is off the top of my head. I'll sometimes refresh myself, you know, sort of scrub radius, okay, what is that again? But uh, generally speaking, this is, if we sat down at a party and you decided I was the most boring possible party guest and you decided to get me going about Miatas, this is what could very well happen. So that's how much, that's how much uh, prep work it's been. And that's why it's a little sort of free flowing at times too. My notes are about four lines, so anyway. Uh, do we have any more questions about the actual alignment aspect of things? Okay. Uh, if you have any more questions about alignment, about the stuff we've covered in this video, please put them in the comments on whatever platform you're watching this on. Uh, we won't be able to answer them live, obviously, but we will uh, answer them in the comments. Um, we like having conversations with people about interesting stuff, so give us interesting stuff to talk about, and we'll talk about it. Um, I would love to tell you what's on for next week, but we don't actually know. <laughs> But uh, thanks, everyone, for your attention. Thanks for the questions. I hope this has answered a few fundamental questions you may have had about alignment that now when you're going to the alignment shop or someone's talking about they're changing their camber, changing their caster, changing their toe, you have a better understanding of what it is that's going on and how they interact. Um, really, alignment is an important part of car setup, but it's not on its own. It's, it's tied into everything else you do. Um, you know, I, I don't have two Miatas parked out there. When I have my V8 Miata and that little red guy parked side by side, they run very, very different alignments because they have very, very different needs, very different suspension setups, very different um, power levels, obviously. Uh, so, you know, the alignment, is, it's part of the whole. And so you've got to make sure that whatever you do with alignment is matched to your choices of spring rates, your choices of sway bars, your choices of even down to the tires if you're getting really hardcore about it. So. Any more questions there, Travis? Nope? Okay, well, thank you very much, folks, for your attention. This is Keith Tanner from Flying Miata. We'll be back next week with something else. Who knows what? Uh, put any requests in the comments. We'll, uh, we'll answer them. And thanks for your attention.